name is Mikko. I am from Finland. I live in Helsinki. And I hunt hackers. That's my job. I've been hunting hackers for decades. And today, I'll be speaking about the things that I think I've learned over the last decades as the whole world has changed for the better and for the worse because of this technology revolution that we are living in the middle of. And the title of the talk is If It's Smart, It's Vulnerable, because that's the title of my new book, which came out last month. I actually was able to be productive during the pandemic. I was able to actually finally write a book that I've been working on for 11 years now. 11 years ago, I did a TED talk, and right after my talk, I was contacted by tons of American publishers, and they told me that, Mikko, all TED speakers write a book, you should write a book. And I've been trying to write a book for 11 years, and I got nowhere. It, apparently, it required a pandemic, because then I had no excuses. Like, Mikko, what are you doing? Nothing. I guess I'm writing a book now. And in the book, I speak about a lot of topics, but today, one topic I want to get into in particular is the cyber arms race. It's one of the topics I cover because the world of offensive use of cyber power has completely changed during our lifetime. The whole talk about governments writing viruses, governments writing malware, governments hacking into each other's systems, all of that would have sounded like science fiction 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And it's very real. And it's right now here. And it's one example of the technology revolution that we've lived through. And the thing about technology revolutions, or actually any revolution, is that when it's big enough, we don't actually see the importance of the revolution because we're living in the middle of it. We all know that technology is changing the world a lot. But it's kind of hard to see just how big the change is. And it's useful to think of this with a longer perspective. Imagine that you are a historian living in the year 2500, and you're writing a history book about our time, about the early 2000s. How would you describe the people who lived in the early 2000s? How would you describe us? And when you look at our generations from a longer perspective, then it's pretty obvious that the thing we will be remembered for forever is that we were the first people who got online. That's it. No more, no less. We will forever be remembered as the first people who got online because the mankind walked the planet for 100,000 years offline. We got online during our time, and now ma mankind will be online forever. We just happened to be born in this time when all of this happened. And this change is changing everything for the better and everything for the worse. The one sentence I keep repeating in my book is that internet is the best thing and the worst thing which has happened during our lifetime. Now this event, this conference, shows us some of the best things which have happened. All this new creativity, all these new tools, all this new connectivity, all this new business, all these new forms of entertainment. It's great. It's excellent. I love the internet. I live online. I love everything that we've been given. I love the fact that internet took away geography. I live far away, up north, in a small country. But then again, I don't. I live on the internet, where it doesn't matter where you live. Your company can go international, you can do business anywhere you want, you can reach anyone anywhere. Borders go away, distances go away, the geography goes away. But then there's the downside. In my home country of Finland, in 1992, we had 114 bank robberies during the year. In one year, 114 cases where bank robbers went into banks with guns to steal cash. Think about that. In 1992. The last time we had a bank robbery, was 12 years ago. 
They're not a thing anymore. Of course they're not. Because, they're, I mean, there's no banks. We don't have banks. The few banks we still have in the real world have no cash. So, like everything else, bank robbers have also gone online. They don't walk into banks with guns. They go online and hack into banks, or use banking trojans, or use keyloggers to steal credit card numbers, or hack into cryptocurrency exchanges to steal Bitcoin, Ethereum, Monero, and Zcash. That's what they do. They have digitalized their business as well. And the difference between the bank robbers of 1992 and the bank robbers of 2022 is that the bank robbers who walked into the bank were walking into the local bank. They were walking into the bank in their own city, in their own town. They were local criminals. Today, when you get hit by a keylogger which steals your credit card number or you fall for a phishing scam which gains access to your bank account, that criminal is not from your town, not from your city, not even from your country. That criminal is from Vietnam, or from Brazil, or from Nigeria, or from, from somewhere in Siberia. The criminals who couldn't reach us before this revolution can now reach us. It's as if internet had given free plane tickets to all the small-time criminals of the world. And the criminals who couldn't reach you beforehand can now reach you. The internet is the best thing and the worst thing that has happened during our lifetime. Another example on how it changed our world for the better and for the worse is how the life of minorities changed. The defining thing about minorities is that they are alone or they feel alone because they're different. And here I mean all kinds of minorities. Maybe based on your skin color or your sexual orientation or your beliefs. Or maybe even something that you have a rare hobby and you feel alone because you don't know anyone else who would have the same hobby as you. Your hobby is that you collect, I don't know, model steam trains and there's no one in your town who has the same hobby. But then internet comes around and you realize that you're far from being alone. In fact, there's a countless amount of people who are just like you who might have their rare hobby, or who think like you, or have the same beliefs. You find support, you find people like you. We are social animals, we like to be around people like us. And the internet gives us support for that. It's been a lifeline for many minorities, which is great and excellent. But then there's the downside. The places where we find this support, where we find people like us, are the online forums and chats and discussion places. And they provide exactly the same kind of support for destructive thoughts. You will find support forums for people who fantasize about school shootings. And they will plan these together and motivate each other to do them. You will find forums where people get radicalized and fall into terrorist groups and join them as an end result of this. You will find support groups for people who are starving themselves or planning suicide. And this is exactly the same thing. The support for people who need it and who enjoy it because they belong into a minority is exactly the same thing as the support for people with destructive thoughts. And we don't get to choose. We get both of them. And technology is not neutral. Many of the tools we build end up being used either more for good, or, but some of them are being used more for bad. And once we invent something, we cannot uninvent it. Here, the best example is strong encryption, strong crypto. When you go online shopping or when you go chatting on WhatsApp, you're protected by strong, uncrackable encryption systems. Well, the math doesn't lie. You could take all the computers in the planet and throw them into trying to crack the encryption, protecting one WhatsApp exchange. 
And of course, they would finally be able to find the right key and crack that chat message. But even if you would use all the computers on the planet, including all the supercomputers, it would take several hundreds of millions of years. So it is crackable, but it will crack your chat after the sun has gone out. And when the sun has gone out, which takes 50 million years, your chat doesn't matter anymore. So this is what we mean by uncrackable encryption. It's, of course, crackable, but it's so strong, it takes hundreds of millions of years to crack. And this is the norm for us now. Even, indeed, Meta or Facebook, who runs systems like WhatsApp, of course, they would like to collect information about us, but, in fact, the encryption they use inside WhatsApp makes the content of the, our discussions encrypted so well that even Facebook or Meta doesn't see it. They will see who you're speaking with and when you're speaking with them. So you keep sending these messages to your pretty colleague every Saturday night around 2 a.m., but they don't know what you're talking about. Now, strong encryption is great, but it's also awful, because bad people use it as well. Criminals use it, extremists use it, terrorists use it. And governments would very much like to put an end to it, but they can't. Because once we've invented something, we cannot uninvent it. So the only thing, the best thing they could do, is to make it illegal to use strong, uncrackable encryption. And there's been discussion about this right here in Europe, over and over again, every couple of years. Should we make it illegal to use strong encryption? Because law enforcement can't see what you're talk talking. They can't watch what bad people talk about, or people that they suspect to be bad people. And of course, we could make it illegal. If we would like to curtail criminals, we, of course, could make the usage of strong encryption illegal. However, the thing that makes criminals criminals is the fact that they break the laws. So if we set something to be illegal so that, that you can't do it, then we, you and me, then we wouldn't do it, but the criminals, of course, would still do it because that's what they do, they break the laws. If you make it illegal to use strong encryption, then all the criminals will have strong security. So governments who originally ignored this revolution, who couldn't care less about this internet technology becoming commonplace, politicians who didn't understand this change, do understand it now. They care about it deeply. Today, Elections are won and lost on the internet. Intelligence agencies have moved their work from the real world to the online world, and militaries and armies are creating cyber weapons to wage their wars. Technology has always shaped our conflicts and has always shaped the wars we fight. Hundreds of years ago, the only place where we would fight our wars was on land. We only had land war. We only had swords and the bow and arrow. We didn't have any better technology than that. Then we got better technology so we could build warships. Nice. So we had war on land and on sea, but the innovation of sea war didn't make land war go away. Then we were fighting wars on both. Then we got airplanes, so air war, satellites and shit, so space war. And now, today, cyberspace war. So five domains where we fight our wars. And it's interesting to note that it's not going to end here. Technology will keep shaping the conflicts we fight. There will be a sixth domain for war. Right now, we have no idea what the sixth domain will be. The only thing we know is that whatever it will be, it's going to sound like science fiction today. We don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to sound like science fiction. So let me throw an example of what it could be. Let's say nano-warfare. Maybe in a couple of decades we'll start to see nano-warfare, where countries at war with each other would fly planes over the other country's area to drop tiny 
airborne robots, which are so small they would enter the bloodstream of the soldier of the enemy and enter their brains and change their thoughts. Does that sound like science fiction? Yes, it does. Just like cyber war sounded like science fiction 30 years ago. And cyber war is here right now, and it is very real. Right now in Ukraine, they are fighting on land, on sea, in air, in space, and in cyberspace. Ever since February 24th, I've every single day been in contact and looked at the situation regarding my field of expertise, which is what's happening in the networks of Ukraine. I speak with Ukrainian cyber soldiers. I speak with the people who are defending their country. And I speak with the people who are recruiting foreigners to join the fight. This is the first time we are, we've seen a war where a country is actively recruiting foreigners to join the war and attack their enemy online. The vice prime minister of Ukraine has been recruiting foreigners to join the fight, which basically is saying, break your own laws. Break the laws in your country to help us and attack our enemy during wartime. And of course, people do that. I know people who are doing that. I am not doing this myself, and I'm not recommending people to do it, but I understand why people do it. I guess I wish I could do it as well. But I'm not willing to cross the line. I do understand why other people do. And my advice for people who are involved, for example, with the IT army of Ukraine, is that take care of your operational security. You don't want to get caught. You don't want it to become public information of what you have done. And whatever you do, never again travel to Russia. And when we look at the activities from Russia against Ukraine and against the rest of the world over these last seven months, it's been a bit surprising because we saw plenty of activity in the beginning of the war. Now, some of you remember that Ukraine has been targeted with Russian nation-state attacks already years ago. For example, they, they had two major power cuts affecting hundreds of thousands of people, which were cyber attacks launched by launched by Russia. In fact, Russia tried doing it, doing it again for the third time this April with a piece of malware we call Indestroyer 2. And they failed. Ukrainians were able to defend their network and keep electricity on. But this is not for the lack of trying. The Russians are trying. And that's an example of the kind of attacks that the Russian um, nation state, Russian government has been doing. Another example fairly famous one is the NotPetya attack from 2018. And some of the very same places in Ukraine which were shut down through their computer systems five years ago or four years ago have now been bombed by the very same military. So they've been hit by both cyber attacks and now by kinetic attacks. But it's not just the Russian government using aggression on Western targets or targets in Ukraine. There's two other players from Russia. There's organized online crime gangs, and then there's patriotic hackers. Most of the crime gangs which have activated during these seven months are existing, older, um, organized cybercrime groups operating in Moscow or in St. Petersburg. Groups like Conti, for example, which in the beginning of the year, had around 400 employees. Mark my words, employees. They were playing salaries to around 400 cybercriminals. They had offices in three different cities. They had their own data centers. They had lawyers on their payroll. This is an organized crime group. They aligned themselves with the Russian government very directly in the very beginning of the conflict, which means they started targeting European energy creation and energy distribution companies with their ransomware attacks which basically means it's a double whammy, they still make their money. They're still launching attacks to make money. Ransomware, which makes bitcoins for them. 
But at the very same time, they choose targets which help their motherland of Russia, and clearly targeting energy creation and energy distribution in this war where energy is one of the weapons is beneficial for the Russian government. And then we have the patriotic hackers from Russia, which the difference here is that they are not trying to make money. And most of the attacks they do are denial of service attacks targeting European ministries or embassies or politicians or symbolic targets of various different kinds. For example, in Finland, our uh, parliament's website has been taken down by these attackers. Defense ministry's website has been taken down by these attackers. And interestingly enough, today, the botnets that are used by groups like these are not made of infected computers. Botnets used to be mostly infected Windows computers. For the last couple of years, most of the big botnets, like the ones used in these attacks, are no longer computers. They are made of thousands of infected home devices, smart devices, smart doorbells, smart coffee machines, smart security cameras, home routers, and so on. When things become smart, they become vulnerable. My favorite example to illustrate what it means is my watch. My watch here is an Omega. It's 20 years old. Mikko, why do you have a 20-year-old watch? Well, I got it after I had worked 10 years with the company where I still work today. So, Mikko, how, why have you worked 30 years at the same company? I don't know. But I have. And when I got this watch 20 years ago, of course, we didn't have smart watches back then. It's mechanical. It's a mechanical watch has no CPU, has no storage, has no internet connectivity, has no Bluetooth. How do you hack this? Well, you don't. There's nothing to hack. Many of you have Garmin's or Suntos or Polar's or Apple Watches, which run code and are online. Are they hackable? Of course they are, every single one of them. They might be hard to hack, but if it's smart, it's hackable. If it's smart, it's vulnerable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miko. Let's have a seat. Have a brief seat. Lovely to end on a very upbeat note there. <laughs> if it's smart, it's hard. Lovely to end on a very upbeat note. There. Sorry. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm going to give you guys a couple of minutes to think of some questions. I'm going to come into the audience, but first a question from me. Um, am I right in thinking that uh, a lot of the cyber attacks that happen actually don't end up hitting the headlines because they go to companies, hackers hit companies and companies, it's almost more uh, cost effective for them to pay ransoms. And if that's the case, are you fighting and, and your colleagues are losing battle? Um, because the biggest single problem we're fighting right now is ransomware, the fact is actually most of the cases end up becoming public. It's in the interest of the attackers to make this public because that's one of the ways they can twist the arm of the victim into paying ransomware. Five years ago, most of the attacks would actually have gone unnoticed and wouldn't hit the headlines. Today, most of them actually do become public. And this has a side effect which creates the impression um, a wrong impression in our minds that, you know, security is in worst shape ever. And actually, it's not. The, the security of our system is actually pretty good. But the fact is that only the problems, only, I mean, the success stories never make the headlines. If, if a company manages to avoid getting hacked, that's not news. The only news we see in newspapers or online news sites is about yet another company getting hacked, which creates us the impression that you know, the situation is really bad. Rarely is anyone thanked for stopping a disaster which didn't happen. Mm. But they're, they're paid well by the companies because it paralyzes the company. You know, if, if, they can't, if their website is down for more than I don't know, a few hours, it's already starting to hit the bank balance. The main reason why the companies I've worked with, which against my advice, paid the ransom, the main reason was typically not 
to get the services back up and running or to get the online store back online or even to get their files back. Typically, they have backups nowadays because all companies are aware of the problem, so they take backups. The reason why they end up paying is that the thieves have stolen all the information, like all the email archives, and they are threatening on posting them online. And, and many companies consider that, you know, we don't care. I mean, if they post our patent applications and our price negotiations, like, you know, we, we, can, we can cope with that. But then they realize that, holy hell, these emails contain really confidential stuff, like our employees having email discussions with the corporate healthcare about their private health issues. Mm. That's going to become public as well. Mm. And then they decide, you know, we, we, we can't have that. We must stop it, and the only way they can stop those leaks is by paying. And the more companies pay, the more bigger this problem becomes. Yeah, sure. Okay, and, and thinking back to how we opened the day with a talk by David Mattins and talking about the tension between people who think uh, we're already past the precipice, we have to yeah, uh, scale back tech, and the other extreme, we have to embrace tech. If we do, talking about the, focusing on that latter, if we embrace tech, isn't the problem for ordinary people and consumers that there's no more trust because of all the publicity about big tech and people stealing our data, very legitimate concerns. So how do you and again, your colleagues go about yeah, winning trust back in, in tech? I think we definitely should embrace technology and embrace this revolution instead of trying to scale it back. It's easy to see that it's the right choice to make if we look at the previous technology revolutions, like the technology revolution of 1870, 150 years ago, when electricity changed the world. And today our societies are completely dependent on electricity. We can't live. Our factories won't be able to make food for our people without electricity. Yet it's clear that our great-grandfathers made the right choice by embracing electricity, even though we are now totally dependent on that. And we are making the right choice by embracing connectivity, even though it will become exactly as mandatory as electricity. It, it's not yet there, but it will be there. And regarding trust, I think many of the problems we see today are an example on how people are actually trusting too much. I mean, that's why people fall for these scams. They click open every link and open every attachment and follow links to every phishing site and fall for every romance scam because they trust too much. Mm. So maybe the solution really isn't about increasing trust but making people trust correctly, making people trust the right things. Yeah, okay. Um, questions from the audience. Who's got some questions? Look at you, you two looking away. Mm, I don't have questions, I don't have questions. <laughs> yes, one at the back. Let me grab a microphone. <laughs> yes, thank you for walking to me. Where is she? <laughs> ah, okay, I'm gonna go this way. Yes, go ahead, I'll hold Thank the mic. You. Thank you very much. There's a nice technology buzzword around since a couple of years. It's quantum computing. Mm -hmm. And related to that, there's quantum cryptography. So from your point of view, will a quantum cryptography uh, help um, companies and governments to uh, decrease the danger of vulnerability, or will there be a balance between the bad ones and the good ones with the help of this tech? Thank you. And perhaps very briefly, what is quantum cryptography? <laughs> quantum isn't here yet. And when it will be here, it's only going to be in the hands of governments and companies which can afford to pay billions for this technology. So it's not going to be, going to be used by criminals. Of course, it can be used by intelligence agencies and militaries for offensive use. But at least it's not going to be in the hands of organized crime gangs. The solution. Well, the problem we, we are faced with quantum um, technology, it, it gives great benefits to us, but the problem it generates is that most of the encryption algorithms we use today will break, um, including very common ones, like when you go online with SSL or TSL connections, those will be broken. They still use technologies which can be broken by quantum if it becomes real, and it might become real in the upcoming years. We do already have quantum-proof encryption algorithms. We simply have to accelerate the usage of, of those, um, and the problem will be non-existent. The biggest problem which will remain is, is intelligence agencies which are collecting 
encrypted information today and save it for decades so they might be able to decrypt it in the future when quantum becomes real. So whatever you're discussing today might be read by an intelligence agency in 20 years time. That's a real problem. For everything else we can solve it by going into quantum proof technologies both for encryption and also for hashing purposes to provide um, other benefits we get from secure technologies. And interestingly enough, one of the earliest uh, deployments of quantum proof technologies is Bitcoin. We still don't know who created Bitcoin in 2009, but Bitcoin uses quantum proof mechanisms. If you use a new address for every transaction, it's safe against quantum. So I don't know who Satoshi Nakamoto is, but he does have a big brain. And lots of money. <laughs> yeah. Okay, listen, that, that was all we have time for, uh, Miko, but uh, thank you very much. Big round of applause, please, for uh, Nico. Thank you.